We've got to protect the environment. The economists make some good points. We need safer energy. Who's right? They are. Visit powerandcooperation.com. My first guest today is best-selling author Charles Murray, a social scientist at the American Enterprise Institute, to talk about his new book, Coming Apart, The State of White America, 1960 to 2010. Welcome, Mr. Murray. Thanks, Jason. I'm glad to be here. So let's start with the title. Um, why the focus on white America and why those years in particular? Well, the focus on white America is to concentrate the brief. I'm, I'm talking about a lot of problems. I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble with hearing you. Can you pick up the phone, uh, Mr. Murray? I can. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. You were talking about the title, uh, why right. the focus on white America and why those years in particular. Just let me turn off the sound coming in. There, there we go. Now I think we won't have as much feedback as we had before. Uh, the reason for the title is because we would need to concentrate people's minds. Whenever you talk about problems, uh, involving things like uh, out-of-wedlock births or unemployment or drop off the labor force. People always say to themselves, oh, well, what he's really talking about there are problems that are located in minority communities or some such thing. By, by having nothing but uh, white non-Latinos, you take away all of that distraction. I'm saying we are not talking about problems that can be solved by dealing with the legacy of slavery or with immigration. These are white Americans who exhibit the same problems. And, and why the focus on the second half of the 20th century? Because that saw this huge cleavage, cultural cleavage, that has no precedent in American history. Let me give you a quick example of a central cultural institution, marriage. Uh, now let's think in terms of working class white Americans, high school education, working in blue collar jobs. In 1960, 84% of adults in that group were married, just about the same as any other socioeconomic group. As of 2010, that number has dropped to 48 percent, fewer than half. What we are looking at is a, is a drawing apart of upper middle class and, for that matter, middle class America from working class America that has no historical precedent. Okay. Uh, another trend you talk about in the book has to do with religion. And um, you found that working class families have become more secular and affluent families have become more religious. Um, this might surprise a lot of people. What's going on here? Well, a, a, a correction there. There has been increased secularization throughout American society, but it's the white working class in which that's dropped away the most. So that now, if you talk about people who both attend church and say they have a strong affiliation with their religion, you're talking about fewer than one out of eight white working class uh, Americans compared to more than twice that 50 years ago, 40 years ago. And, and what this means is, is much broader than uh, any opinions you have about religion. Uh, it has to do with social capital. Social capital meaning all the ways in which communities deal with their problems without the government having to get involved. Social capital is intensely located among those who are religious. Uh, when you see that kind of change in religiosity in white working class America, you're also seeing a huge drying up of social capital. So you're, you're saying religion helps to socialize people, sort of regulate moral behavior. So the, the, the numbers, the data on, on uh, religiosity inform the, the, the numbers on, on marriage that you were just talking about. They inform also all sorts of, you, you name it, from everything from uh, little league teams and whether you can find enough people to coach them, uh, to charities, uh, to, to uh, participation in town council meetings. All of that is, is closely related to the religiosity of the community you're dealing with. The more secular it is, the harder it is to find people who are engaged in those kinds of activities. Well, well, didn't the elites rebel against all this in the 60s and 70s? God, the traditional family, etc. Wasn't that what the counterculture was all about? Yeah, the counterculture was all about that. But here's what happened with the upper middle class. Uh, they said, well, you know, maybe we went too far with that. So if you take a look at marriage, for example, among the upper middle class, there was a decline during the 1970s and the early 1980s, and then it stabilized. If you look at uh, work habits, the upper middle class is still working really hard. If you, if you look at religiosity, 
the decline in that has started to stabilize. So in a way, you have one group in this country uh, which participated in and even led the counterculture, which sort of said, never mind, we thought better of it. In the meanwhile, the white working class is still caught in all of the uh, uh, deleterious effects of that movement. Okay. Um, we ran an excerpt, as you're aware, of, your, uh, of, of the book in the Wall Street Journal recently, and one of the letters in response asked what impact uh, the lack of a military draft has had on the trends that you described. Do you have a response to that? Well, if you're talking about World War II level draft, it sure would have had a, a big effect on that, of mixing people uh, of all different socioeconomic levels. If you reinstituted a draft now, uh, with the size of military we have, it's going to catch very, very few people from the upper middle class. Uh, in theory, the military can serve as a great mixer. In practice, it doesn't deal with enough people to make much difference. Okay. Now, later on the show today, I'm going to be talking to a Manhattan scholar about a new study on racial segregation. And that study shows that it's been reduced markedly in recent decades. So you're arguing that cultural segregation is increasing. Um, we're becoming more of a caste society. And he says racial segregation is declining. Can both of you be right? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, the, the good news is precisely that, that racial seg segregation has diminished markedly. In the meantime, you have the zip codes of the United States have become much more polarized in terms of their educational and income levels. So you now have, here, here, here's a quick example for those of you in New York City, the median income in 1960 on the Upper East Side, and I'm expressing that in today's dollars, was $59,000. <laughs> and that's in today's dollars. And the Upper East Side now has levels of income and of education which swamp uh, what they were in 1960. The same thing has happened all over the country. Uh, you have now enclaves in which the people who run the country live uh, that have very little relationship to an ordinary zip code lived in by ordinary Americans. Okay. Now, politically, I know you self-describe as a libertarian, and I'm wondering what role you think our politicians and public policymakers have had in the trends that you describe in the book. Has, for instance, the increase of the size of the welfare state played a role in this? It's played a huge role, I think. Uh, I've, I made those arguments at length in a book called Losing Ground uh, many years ago. I still believe that to be true. But you know, Jason, at this point, uh, the causes are not as important as they used to be because the toothpaste is out of the tube. And, and what I want to focus on in this book, because this book is addressed to people of all political opinions, is the nature of the problem. The kind of cultural cleavage we're looking at now threatens to change America from the civic culture we have treasured to one which looks a lot more like Latin America, with the rich people on the hill and the poor people down below. Uh, and behaving in different cultural ways that transcend economic inequality. Until we recognize that problem and its gravity, uh, talking about policy solutions is irrelevant. Okay, last question. Uh, we got about a minute left. In the last chapter of the book, you talk about America's future. And you say you're concerned not that we'll lose our wealth or power anytime soon. It's that we'll lose our heritage. We'll lose what makes us exceptional. What do you mean by that? Remember how Americans used to brag about we're all in the middle class? How Americans used to brag about uh, the ways in which they were connected with the real people? Nobody wanted to be uh, a snob. Nobody wanted to be to self-describe as upper class. All that's changing. Uh, we now have a lot of people in this country in very powerful positions who are much more at home with European intellectuals and the European upper class than they are with their fellow Americans. And that is a betrayal of something really important uh, and valuable about the American heritage. In the blink of an eye, the new M-Class will monitor blind spots.